So this is a uh, this is a real workshop talk. It's paper is not yet in archive, but it's because archive has a little delay, so you can get it there. All right. So uh, this is a paper we've been working on for a long time. It's something that I'm I'm very excited about. Uh, so I'm just going to start with reinforcement learning very quickly. I'm pretty sure everybody knows this, but you have an observation, you have a policy, it chooses an action, and then you uh, you have another observation. And then you have the policy, which chooses an action, and then you see a reward. And your goal is to maximize the sum of rewards. This is a very straightforward thing, right? OK, so moving beyond that, I want to think about what's hard in reinforcement learning. And there's, there's a, a set of different problems which come up in reinforcement learning. One of these, that, which everybody's familiar with, is credit assignment. How do you know which move lost the game? Another one is exploration. You need to gather the information actively that you need in order to solve the problem. And then a third one is generalization. If you're going to deal with a, a complex sensor space, like a camera, then you, you have to be able to generalize from, from one image to another, or else the, the, you're dead in the water. Okay, so um, there's these three problems. And if you think about it carefully, you realize that every pair of these problems is solved. So if you're trying to do generalization with credit assignment, that's policy improvement algorithms. Think of policy gradient. PPO, <clears throat> various things like this. If you want to think about MDP learning, well, there's the old uh, like E cubed line of work, which talks about um, how to solve any Markov decision process um, in polynomial time and the number of states. Right? And then it requires that you actually visit each of these states and know each of these states as being able to identify them. And then the last one. Uh, if you were trying to do generalization and exploration, well, then contextual balance solves this. Right? So there's no credit assignment problem in contextual balance. That makes it much easier. And we know very well refined ways to do exploration and contextual balance now. So the really hard problem is a combination of all three. How do we actually get at all three? So we've been running a research program trying to figure out how to get at all three for the last several years. And, and we reached uh, something which I think is really great. So I'm going to describe first the kind of problem that we want to solve. So let's think about a hard reinforcement learning problem. And in a hard reinforcement learning problem, you might start in a mixed state. So you have 50% chance of going to the upper state, 50% chance of going to the lower state. And then if you have some action, maybe this action takes you to uh, two different states, 50% chance. Uh, and then maybe for the other state, there's some other action which, again, leads you 50% chance to each of the two states. And OK, now, so we have stochastic transitions. That makes it kind of tricky. Uh, let's go beyond that. Let's have a whole bunch of distracting actions which shift you to some third state. And let's give these distracting actions a small reward just to make this extra fun to solve. And now let's repeat this 100 times. And then let's, uh, let's have a reward, a big reward, in these upper states if you manage to get there. OK, so who thinks this is a hard problem to solve? Now, this is actually solved 20 years ago. This was the E cubed algorithm. It could, it could solve this quite well. But we're going to make one more twist. The twist is you're not going to see the states. Instead, you're going to see some sort of complex observation. <laughs> We actually have a, a version of this problem. Uh, and these are different observations all drawn from the same state. Okay, so you, you're never going to see the same observation twice. They're going to actually differ substantially. Uh, you can't just do simple pixel distance type things. Uh, there's no like simple heuristics for, for solving this problem. OK, so just going through things again, why is this hard? Well, you have stochastic start. You have stochastic transition. You have unfavorable dynamics. If you act randomly, you're going to end up losing. You have anti-shaped rewards. This is a fun one. Uh, Google um, is the number 10 to the 100. So if you act randomly, you have a 1 in Google chance of actually observing a large reward. It's Google sparse. All right, so then uh, the last really real component here is that generalization is, is required. You have to somehow generalize from some observations to 
uh, to other observations in order to perform effectively. Okay, so this, this, in, this problem encapsulates all three of those hard directions. And so if we can make progress on this problem, then maybe we're, we're doing something useful. Okay, so if you start out with uh, common reinforcement learning algorithms and you ask which states do they manage to visit after 10 million traces, what you see is something like, okay, advantage actor critic, it, it visits about three or four depth in the good states, and then it, it, it's just all <coughs> in the bottom. So this is, um, it's tough. Yeah? The observations are different between the first and the second states. The emission process is going to be different. But it's, it's not a simple thing like, oh, you can just cluster it, right? It's, it, uh, it's going to be tricky. All right, so this, this is what uh, Advantage Actor Critic does. It, it, it explores a little bit of random exploration, manages to get a little ways, but then it, it, it fails. And just to emphasize here, 10 to the 100 uh, is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So you're not going to ever succeed by trying to brute force this. Uh, proximal policy optimization is, ends up being similar to uh, advantage actor critic in terms of how far it manages to go. All right, so if you use random network distillation, which is a recently published algorithm, which is intended to, it's kind of a heuristic to go and explore areas that you, you don't know about very much. It's actually, it has some teeth. It, it does get you a ways, much better than random chance. Uh, but, but it still doesn't really make it. Okay, so then, uh, so then this is the new algorithm, which I'm gonna talk about today. And if you look at this closely, you can see that, in fact, it's starving out the dynamically favored lower states here. It's exploring pretty uniformly all the way across. And naturally, it manages to solve this problem quite effectively. Yeah? If you ask a person to solve a single problem, you will fail. That's a good question. Uh, if you ask a person to solve a similar problem, will he solve as well, fail as well? Uh, I think for this particular representation, it's a little bit tough. But if I had like a rendering of an image with various things varying in the image dependent upon extraneous random events, I think it would actually end up being pretty reasonable to solve. In fact, there's a game I played once where essentially you had to solve an MDP using various site information. It wasn't easy, but it was in fact doable. This, because this is 100 steps, it's pretty long. I think the one I solved in the game was more like 20 steps. But there's no fundamental reason why a human would be unable to solve this problem, or this kind of problem. It would be challenging, but I think with deliberate thought, you could solve it. Anything else? All right, so uh, just to reiterate a little bit, uh, let's say we want to achieve the maximum reward, or at least a half of the maximum reward. How many episodes does it take to actually discover that for versions of the problem with varying uh, horizon lengths? You can see that up to 25, uh, these uh, random network distillation approaches can be effective, and then beyond that, it's just this Homer algorithm, which can actually be effective. Okay, and then you can also look at, as you're solving things, uh, what's the performance given condition on the number of episodes when you only have a horizon length of 100? And you can see that Homer is a little strange. Everything is basically flat. Homer's flat initially, and there's a little bit of a plateau here, and then there's a big jump where it solves the problem effectively. 
Okay. Yeah? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you where it is in a moment. <clears throat> okay, so um, we started with theory in thinking about this problem. And I want to start with theory here and thinking about the problem in a bit more depth. So how do you even formulate the problem of achieving generalization and exploration and credit assignment all together? So our goal is going to be to compete with some policy class. That's pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to think about the episodic setting where you restart. It could be in some distribution, but you restart. And then we have an episode of some length. We'll call that H. And then we're going to see some observation X, which is in some high dimensional space. And then we're going to choose some action A. Um, so we have discrete actions. And then we're going to see some reward at the end. And then there's, OK, so this isn't telling you the full formal model. But let me tell you a little bit more about what I'm thinking about. Uh, so first of all, I would call this here a contextual decision process. Because you're, you have a decision process, it's, 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 a, it's a long horizon, and you have a context here on which you're deciding what to do. Uh, okay, so in order to make this tractable, so in general, this is an intractable. It's very easy to make kind of like infinite trees uh, in which, in order to discover the optimal leaf, you just have to go through every single possible leaf. But in order to make this tractable, we could say, oh, suppose that there's some latent state S, which generates this X by some probabilistic process. Right? It could be some unknown probabilistic process. Right? And we'll just, just to make sure this is hard, we're going to think of this as being stochastic. So there's no, you don't see the same X twice. It isn't, it's not a problem of you know, memorizing the X's that you see. OK, and then for the action, this is going to cause some sort of stochastic transition in the latent state S prime. So think of a Markov decision process. You have some distribution over the next state given the underlying latent state and the action you choose. And then the reward is going to be generated. It, it can be generated by anything. We can think of it as dependent upon the X, A, the X prime. It could be dependent upon the latent states. Uh, and I have this written here as being per episode, but I'm, I'm fine with making it be per action. Uh, either way. So this is where it differs from pumpkins that the reward depends on observations and not the real state. So um, does this differ from pumpkins? I'm just I'm not constraining where the reward comes from. In a pumpkin, maybe you would have it be dependent upon the state. Uh, I guess I wanted to allow the reward to be correlated with the state, so it's not an independent draw. But I think this is actually a very minor thing in terms of the difficulty of the problem. All right, so, but, but pomni P's are the right thing to think about for a moment because pomni P's in general are intractable, right? And so far I've described things which are like a pomni P. But I'm going to make some trick, some assumption to, to make it be simpler. And I'll do that in just in a moment. Other questions? All right. OK, so I'm going to make two assumptions. I'm going to assume, first, a block MDP structure. And what that means, essentially, is that for every observation x, there's a unique x which can generate it, which means that there exists some function that you don't know which can decode the latent state from your observation. Okay. So, so this is why it's not a POMDP. It's a special case of a POMDP, yeah. Uh, okay. And now, okay, so, so that, that seems good. Um, it's, it's useful. We're going to make one more assumption, which is that essentially that we can solve supervised learning problems. Right, so we're going to do this in an oracle learning or a reduction like framework. We're going to assume that if I pose a regression problem, I'll be able to solve that. Or if I pose a classification problem, I'll be able to solve that. Okay, so this, I think, is, I would argue this is, this is a great assumption to make <laughs> because. Unless you start making these kinds of assumptions, it gets really hairy to deal with any kind of uh, structure where you have to do deep learning, which indeed we're going to do here. Yeah, so the exact class I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, and there, there are a few constraints on the class. But it, it, the, here's the central difficulty here is 
is computational. Uh, this, is a, this is a computational assumption. Um, I don't want to have to enumerate all the policies and check each one to see how they perform according to some metric and then choose the best. I want a mechanism for searching it in that space. And uh, yeah, we're going to do that. What's that? It seems like a pretty big assumption. Yeah, it is, it is an assumption, the, the block MDP. So um, one reason why it's more reasonable today than yesterday is that in general, sensors are getting stronger. Right? So if I had a camera looking at this room, you would actually be able to identify who was in each seat uh, to uh, good quality. Um, and if you move the camera around, every different position of the camera would be a different pose of the camera. The underlying state space would be the poses in some sense. Uh, so it, it would, I, I think it's, okay, another way to say this is OpenAI just cheated in the same way, right? So they did the, uh, this little Rubik's Cube thing and they, they added tons of sensors to the Rubik's Cube so they could disambiguate. <coughs> so in many situations, I think that we can use a rich sensor space uh, to help us do reinforcement learning. So the, the situation where you have a large state space and a small sensor space is, is not at all solved by this. Um, but the rich sensor space setting is becoming more and more common as a computational artifact. John, is my backpack here or here? That I don't know. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the claim is that Homer solves all block MDP problems. Uh, in polynomial of uh, number of states, latent states, number of actions, and the time horizon samples, if the Oracle learning works. Okay, so that's, that's great. It's nice for all. Okay, so the key thing is this is independent of the size of the observation space. Right, and that means, for example, that if I had a video of this room, I could concatenate all the images in the video, and I could answer your question unambiguously in this model. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, there's sort of several key concepts which we, uh, are in this paper. Uh, one of them is the notion of a kinematic state. This is a new kind of state abstraction. Um, and essentially it's observations with the same causal dynamics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more. I'm going to tell you what this means formally. So there's actually two kinds of kinematic state. There's backward and there's forward. Okay, so for, for backward, you have a, a next state observation one and a next state observation two. And if for all distributions over the previous observation and action, uh, the probability using Bayes' law on the transition dynamic structure of x and a given x prime is the same. Okay, so that's um, a little bit hard to swallow. We have a distribution over a next state given the state in the action, so it's conditioning the other way. We have some distribution over x and a. That means we can apply Bayes' law to reverse the conditioning. We just want to make sure that uh, no matter what we're conditioning on, we get the same distribution. Okay, so that's backwards kinematic inseparability or kinematic state. Then we also have forward kinematic state. Here what happens is a little bit more straightforward. You have an observation, another observation, uh, and you want it to be the case that the transition structure over our next observations is the same regardless of whether or not it's x1 or x2. And now kinematic state is both of these together. Yeah? So what you call a kinematic state backward and forward is partition of parts in partition of observation space? Say it again, please. Uh, so what you call kinematic state here yeah. are these parts Yeah, so we're thinking about kinematic state as partitioning the observation space. 
because that we have this block MDP assumption, which says that there is some decoding. That decoding in, implies a partition. And now I want to kind of define uh, structurally what that partition is going to be. Because so, uh, let me go a little bit further. Um, there's the structure of the world, and there's a structure that we're going to create inside of our learning algorithm. And these actually differ a little bit, right? So in the, in the world, we're saying, oh, look, there's a block MDP. Inside of our algorithm, we're going to say, oh, we have kinematic states. And then, of course, the trick is these kinematic states are going to be similar to the underlying latent states in the, uh, in the block MDP. Yeah? Yeah. This whole thing can be solved by exploring all the, the states in the same model, this two? So if you had secret knowledge of what the states were, then yes, you could just explore the underlying dynamics very easily and ignore the observation space. But we don't have that knowledge. So that difficulty is the kind of possible multiple observation for the states. Yeah, yeah. There was another question? Is, is this very similar to bi-simulation? Bi-simulation. I don't know that one. You have to explain it to me afterwards, I think. Anything else? Okay, so another key concept is a homing policy. The idea here is you want a policy which finds something with highest probability, and that something could be an observation, or it could be uh, one of the latent states. So we want uh, we want to find we want a policy which is the maximum over all policies and implicitly the dynamics of the world of the probability of reaching that observation or that latent state. Okay, and then uh, if you have a kinematic state, it's a quick observation that, that implies that every observation is homed by the same policy. Right? That means that the, the number of homing policies we might be concerned with is inherently relatively small because it's dependent upon the latent state space rather than our observation space. Okay, so now let's go to the algorithm. So, uh, just to be clear, this is not curriculum learning here. This is iterations inside of the algorithm. So we're always running in the 100 step episodic <coughs> trace world. And now we're going to do something at each time step, uh, iteratively, and build up our representation of the world so that we can solve these complex problems. <coughs> Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna sample uniformly from a policy cover. So a policy cover is a set of homing policies for the previous time step. Okay, so we're gonna sample one policy, which is designed to home to one of our latent states at the previous time step. And now this is, I'm, I'm assuming this inductively, so I'm gonna to have to give you this for the next time step at the end of this uh, iteration. We're going to run with this sampled policy h minus one steps, uh, and then we're going to act uh, uniform random. At the end of that trace, we're going to see the observation from h minus one, the random action, and the observation from uh, h, from time step little h. And now we're going to construct a supervised data set. We're gonna say 50% chance we're going to keep things as they are with a label of one. Otherwise, uniformly, we're gonna replace X prime with some other X prime drawn by this process. And we're gonna produce a label of zero. Okay, so um, this is some sort of auxiliary prediction task that we're creating. And now we're gonna solve this next. So we're going to learn to predict whether or not X prime has been corrupted. So in particular, uh, okay, we're gonna do this in a little bit of a funny way. So I could just have a function of X, A, and X prime, which predicts Y. But instead, I'm gonna add some structure. I'm gonna say this function consists of essentially a lookup table and a bottleneck here and a bottleneck here and the, uh, taking, uh, taking the action as well into account. And so this phi prime of x prime is maybe the most critical one. We're going to, this can be in some, some arbitrary function. 
but we're going to restrict the range of its output. We're going to say that maybe it only has you know 30 output values or three output values or something. Um, whatever is necessary to solve this problem to uh, sufficient precision. Okay, so are there questions about this? So if you solve this problem effectively, then for each value of the bottleneck, you're going to create a synthetic reward function, and you're going to find a homing policy to achieve that value. Okay, and now this, this fine policy routine is actually something that's pretty well solved. This was uh, Drew Bagnell's thesis, Policy Search for Dynamic Programming. It's a reduction of essentially reinforcement learning to contextual bandits when you know how to visit the, uh, the individual latent states. Okay, so now uh, we found the homing policy for all the states of this time step. We just create the policy cover for the next time step, and then we iterate. And at the end, we're just going to return the policy cover. So are there questions about this? So once you have the policy cover for all the time steps, it's very easy to just uh, construct a policy to optimize whatever external rewards defined for the block MDP. Right? Because you can just run this fine policy uh, subroutine again. Okay, so now, now going back a little bit, uh, what's going on here? Uh, back, back, right. Uh, here, we're just doing everything I just told you. Here, we're uh, running find policy cover to find that last policy, and here we're exploiting it. So are there any questions about this so far? Okay. Ooh, did not come through. Interesting. That is fascinating. Let me, uh, here. I think I'm missing a color. Okay, well, uh, there are little state bubbles there. Uh, one of the interesting side effects of this algorithm is that you, for free and actually by necessity, are essentially discovering a state abstraction. Right? So if you, if you pay attention closely to the algorithm, let's go here, uh, you see that there's this phi as well as this phi prime, but I'm really only using the phi prime here. So why do we have this phi? In the, okay, so there's two reasons. At a, at a practical level, unless you bottleneck this, you're gonna have much more information here than here, and so you're gonna to tend to overfit to the noise in X much more than you would otherwise. It's a practical detail. But it's also the case that phi is necessary to do state abstraction, because phi prime is not quite enough to do that. Um, and this is an example of a state abstraction which is constructed. You have to imagine the uh, little states there uh, from the traces of the running algorithm using phi and phi prime. All right, so it's perfect up to here where there's something funny that happened. All right, so we collapsed two of the good states. And we're, at first we were like, hmm, we have a bug here. But then we realized that we were drawing, when we were constructing the problem, we were drawing the choice of the action randomly from one of 10 possibilities. And that meant that there was about a one in 10 chance that the two actions happened to agree. And then it did not matter that you were in this upper state or this lower state. And so this is actually the correct output. This is the correct state abstraction uh, for the purpose of a kinematic state. Oh, 
man. Okay, now we can see the states barely. Okay. Um, I could go into the proof, but the proof is actually going to be pretty straightforward. It, it's it's a little bit long, but uh, you you want to show that the kinematic states end up being equivalent to a conical form of the underlying latent state space. And then there's, there's a bunch of working out the details, and the polynomial is nowhere near optimal, so I don't think that the proof itself is actually that interesting. What I think is interesting is looking at a hard example that we thought about a lot when we were trying to come up with a good algorithm. Because that kind of informs you about the structure of the space and how you need to think about solving this problem. <clears throat> okay, so Let's think about a hard situation where we have uh, a stochastic initial state. And, <clears throat> okay, so if you look at this, we see that if we do A1 and then A1, we get to S7. If we do A2 and then A2, we also get to S7. And that means that, means that dynamically it's possible to reach state S7, right? So that means that we should end up with a homing policy for state S7 and not, for example, for the combination of S7 and S8. But if you look at this, it's actually kind of tricky because you're in S1 and S2 to begin with. You take a random action, uh, maybe A1, maybe A2, and regardless of whether or not you're in S1 or S2, you're going to end up in an information set here. So if you take A1, you end up in S3 and S4. If you take A2, you end up in S5 and S6. So that means that S3 and S4 can't be distinguished based upon observations right here. Right? So that means that Homer, when it's running, or any approach when it's running, will say, oh, this is a state, this is a state, and this is a state. All right, so, yeah? Yeah, so we have observations. The observation space is capable of distinguishing S1 and S2, but we have no supervised signal saying that we should distinguish them. Okay. So the information is there in the observation space, but it's not there in the artificial problem that we're creating. Okay. Right? Okay, so then if we have this as a kinematic state and this is a kinematic state, and we act uniform randomly, we're going to end up in S7 or S8, because in both cases, you know, it's 50% chance of each of these. So Homer will actually solve this, because if you permute the X prime, which is what Homer does, there's a, you can distinguish between the, this kinematic state with A2 and this kinematic state with A1. Okay, and then that will induce a partitioning over these information states in the long run. But there's a lot of other approaches which don't work here. Right? So in particular, uh, there's this curiosity-driven exploration paper, right, where they are essentially predicting the, the action given this observation and the next observation. Right? That doesn't work here. Um, you can also try to predict uh, the action plus the previous state given X prime. That's what our previous paper at ICML was about. That also does not work here. And another thing that you can observe is that you can't construct homing policies incrementally doing this. Because the homing policy to reach S7 is going to, it's, it's not like a concatenation of the homing policy to reach S3 or S4 and another step something where you have to reach back in time, and that's where the, uh, the policy search for dynamic programming uh, becomes very useful. Okay, so are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah. And, but how does that generalize? Because maybe the data that wasn't in the supervised data said we should have partitioned it differently. 
Say again, because why? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're we're assuming here that we can solve this problem uh, to without representational constraints. So we're, we're we're essentially assuming that this contains the optimal solution over all possible representations. And that means that um, the partition that it induce, induces is unambiguous unless there's ambiguity in the prediction problem itself. Right? So for the hard problem I just showed you, there is actually ambiguity, whether or not it should be S1 and S2 or S3 and S4 are equivalent as far as, optimization, uh, as, far as the induced optimization goes. No. I think the algorithm to check this out is essentially try it and, um, and see if it works. Right? So whether or not you can solve these prediction problems is dependent upon the problem. Uh, it, it may be non-trivial. It, it did require some work for us to solve uh, this Google sparse uh, combination lock. But, but, but Yes, essentially, okay. right? It, it could easily be the case that the algorithm succeeds even if the assumptions are not met. In fact, they're not formally met in the, in the problem we were solving because the kind of noise we were in inducing involve uh, some Gaussians which have support everywhere and so there's at least a small chance that two different latent states would create the same observation. But um, if it's the case that these assumptions are met, then a failure of the algorithm is a failure of your optimization. And it's a very different place from where most reinforcement learning algorithms are because often they fail because they just simply do not have the information necessary to succeed. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're thinking about this last example, right? All right, so I guess, uh, remember that you have different observations for S7 versus S8. And that means that if you are in this kinematic state and uh, you take action one, it's going to be observably different from if you're in, the chance of getting reaching S7 is going to be, uh, let me phrase this the right way. Um, so if you have a corrupted trace, it will say something like, I was in this kinematic state, I took action uh, one, and then I saw S7. Well, no, that's a correct race. I, I took action two, and then I saw S7. All right, so. Let's talk about it offline, I think. But it, it does work. There's a subtle change in the dynamics here, right? Because S6 goes here while S5 goes there. It's a little bit different and it's detectable. Yeah? Yeah, so it, I think the question is, is forward kinematic inseparability good enough? And the answer is no, it's not. There's a, 
a counterexample. Okay, so this is um, a line of work. Uh, we've been trying to figure out how to solve these contextual decision processes for several years. Uh, several people have helped us uh, as well along that path. And then, of course, there's a lot of, I think, really important problems to address. We've discovered that it's possible to do this, that's, uh, given certain kinds of structure. We know we need to have some kinds of structure. There may be other kinds of structure which we can benefit from, and in fact, some of these algorithms back here are much more information theoretic and they do work for broader structures. We would like to figure out how to make the algorithm more incremental. It seems like it's a, a good goal. Uh, we would like to figure out how to handle continuous states and actions. That seems essential for all kinds of robotics type applications. And we would like to figure out how to handle combinatorial states. So right now we're relying upon the underlying state space being small. But in the real world, often uh, things are combinatorial, right? So uh, this finger is kind of independent of this finger to a large extent. <clears throat> so those are, I think, uh, really good problems to be thinking about. And uh, I certainly welcome anybody who wants to help us think about them. Uh, so it's, it's an invitation. And, uh, and yes, we are indeed hiring. Any other questions?